course. We welcome you all to this conversation about democracy and capitalism. We find ourselves in an extraordinary moment to be having this conversation. Before we jump in, I just want to take a minute to introduce you introduce you to the Aspen Institute a little bit and to the Aspen Business and Society Program. I said I lead the Business Society Program. It's a 22-year-old program of the Aspen Institute, and we are committed to work through leadership, development, and dialogue to pursue business decision-making that works for everyone in society and for the long-term health of the planet. And I'm pleased today to be able to lead this conversation, which we think is an incredibly important moment for both higher education and for society at large. Why is it important? As we all know, as COVID has unfolded, we've often heard, and we like to say that we're all in this together. But of course, we know that that's not entirely true. The COVID-19 and its economic ramifications are turning out to be starkly different for different groups of individuals. And in the U.S. and now well beyond, we're seeing protests over racial injustices that only underscore the deep and systemic inequalities in our society. Just from this morning's headlines, we have that 700 cities were mobilized across the country. People of all races and walks of life have been participating, and we're starting to see the impact of these protests. We saw an uptick in the jobs report, but we know that still leaves fewer than, half, fewer than half of black adults who are actually employed in the United States. And the uptick in jobs, during that uptick, we actually saw the unemployment numbers for blacks and Asians continue to increase. Today, we're gonna to be talking about three sets of institutions, higher education, business, and the institutions of democracy. Out of this tragic set of months, this period in late winter and spring, we believe we have the chance to rebuild our economy and social fabric and to reimagine how we measure success as nations and as businesses. Today, we're gonna to hear from our panelists about what they see as the possibilities in this moment and how they think now about their role of the institutions that they lead. Many of you with us today are members of our undergraduate consortium, and we extend a very special welcome to you. If you're new to that work, let me just say that the consortium builds and helps support college-based teams of change agents, faculty and administrators, who are working to integrate the liberal arts and the humanities into the teaching of business at the undergraduate level. You all know that the demand for business degrees at the undergrad level is still rising, and that educators in the consortium are working then to assure that as they prepare students with the business and management skills that they need, that they're also preparing them with the critical thinking skills and the thoughtful perspective about the role of business that we need both as citizens and as business managers and executives. There are some 85 liberal arts colleges and business schools that have been part of this consortium since it began in 2012. And under a different set of circumstances, we would be meeting right now in Pennsylvania, hosted by Wharton and Bucknell and Franklin and Marshall. Instead, we're together under different circumstances, and in some respects, the constraint of not being able to meet personally has opened up our lens and has allowed us to invite many more to the table. And we're excited by how many of you are being introduced to this work and are part of this conversation for the first time. And in fact, it's an extraordinary set of institutions that are represented. Large colleges, small universities, small liberal arts institutions, Jesuit schools, historically black colleges. We welcome all of you, East Coast to West Coast and well beyond to Edinburgh, Korea, and to Tel Aviv. So thank you very much for being part of this today. And with that, I'm honored to introduce our panelists. First, I warmly welcome Michael Sorrell. Michael has served as president of Paul Quinn College for the last 13 years in Dallas, Texas. Paul Quinn is a historically black college 
that has served um, many students, 85% of which are on Pell Grants. His um, school is known as, as the first urban work college, and this goes well beyond work study. It's actually a gateway into work. It's, it's, a, it's a real gateway into the, work, the world of work. And I'm hoping to see Michael join me here on the screen. Well, I'm here. You're there. There you are, Michael. Second, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to welcome Ann Harrison, the Dean of the Haas School of Berkeley at UC Berkeley. Anne's a scholar in international trade with a particular emphasis on creating inclusive and sustainable policies in development economics and global labor markets. In the universe of business education, Berkeley, of course, has a massive footprint. 2,500 students across six degree programs, which includes an undergraduate program of 700 students. <clears throat> a highly rate institution that is highly sought after and is one that is viewed as having a very high return on investment. And then finally, I'm delighted to, to uh, invite Dan Porterfield to the screen as well. Dan is CEO and president of the Aspen Institute. Dan has stepped into his role in 2018 and he comes out of academia. Many of you knew him as president of Franklin and Marshall College and before that in his role as head of strategic development at Georgetown. And again, I hope to see them soon join us on the screen. Thank you, Judy. Are you there? I don't yet get to see you. Well, this is Dan. I don't know if you can hear me, Judy. There you are. Okay, good. Thank Great. you. Great to be here. And Anne, we're still missing you. Really? I see myself. There we are. Okay, now we can see you all. <laughs> Great. So um, first, let me just tell you how we're going to manage this time together. First, we're going to talk with Ann and Michael and uh, ask them a little bit to reflect on what they're seeing in this moment and how they're thinking about the challenges ahead for both their institutions and for higher ed more generally. After that, we're going to turn to Dan and, and kind of widen the scope a bit and talk about the role of institutions like Aspen in this moment, but also calling out this kind of question of the role of humanities in the teaching of undergraduates. And then best we can, we're gonna to try to widen the lens further and engage all of you through, you have a, a chat button, I'm sorry, it's a, uh, on the Q&A button, you'll be able to record both your thoughts and any questions that you would like to pose to the panel. And we will wrap up uh, at 3.15. So the Q&A button is below. And with that, let me open it up. So what I'm going to ask, I'm going to start out with, with Anne and with Michael. Um, what I'd like to do is kind of see if we can tr do a little tri time travel and go backwards in time, if we can remember what it was like before we started down this, this uh, moment of crisis. Obviously, there are other challenges still in our lives for our institution, and higher ed has been under a lot of pressure for years. So I was hoping that, let me start with you, Michael, and then turn to Anne. If you could tell a little more fully a little bit about your institution and what kind of priorities you are facing in your leadership. So Michael, let's start with you at Paul Quinn. Sure, so <clears throat> Paul Quinn College, as you stated, is a historically black college. We were founded in 1872 and our mission was to educate freed slaves and their progeny. Um, as we move forward into modern education, what we have done is carved out a niche of being an institution that responds to the challenges of society in a very direct and aggressive fashion. Um, we, up until the last 10 or so years, were an institution that did not have a big national reputation. Um, and we asked ourselves, if we are to go forward, what is it that we can offer to the marketplace that makes us compelling? And we decided that we would address the needs of under-resourced communities. And the number one need of under-resourced communities is the fight against poverty. And so for us, this underscored this mentality that what we will be the most concerned with is that which is in the best interest of our students 
and their families. So everything we do starts with the question, how does this impact our students? What is the right thing to do? And, you know, there's <clears throat> a great phrase that um, we picked up from Marcus Aurelius's great book, The Emperor's Handbook, that talks about choosing the harder right over the easier wrong without apparent regard to self-interest. And that is how we try to conduct ourselves. And so in this time, in this era, right now, we look at this and we think, number one, um, it presents a unique opportunity to ask some critical questions about not just what we're doing, but what holes in the marketplace, again, need to be filled across all of higher education. And what are our unique competitive advantages that allow us to address those in a timely fashion and to move forward. And so while we are deeply concerned about what we are seeing in terms of how this society is choosing to battle a global pandemic, um, we have opted to really aggressively attack um, in the spaces that we think need to be addressed. And we're, you know, we're gonna spend the entire summer announcing some incredibly exciting and new initiatives. Let's, uh, let's come back to that. Anne, let me turn to you, if you can kind of like, again, try to remember what things were like um, maybe six months ago. What, what, what are some of the priorities? What's been on your plate? You've been Dean now since January 2019, I believe. So I'm sure it's been a whirlwind period of time. Yes, it's, it's hard to think back uh, to before the last three months, but let me try. Uh, when I became Dean a, a year and a half ago, uh, at the time, the only woman dean of a top 10 business school, I had three goals. Um, my first goal was to make us the most innovative school and entrepreneurial school of, of any top business school. My second goal was to create the most diverse, equitable, and inclusive environment of any business school in the country to make UC Berkeley and Haas look more like the rest of California, a state where 50% of our high school students are Latinx. And my third goal was to create a more sustainable future. Uh, I have a background both in trade and in the environment, and I believe that preserving our planet is critical. Those were my goals when I started, and they're still my goals over the long term. In fact, some of these goals, the second in particular, but also the third and the first, are, have never been more critical than a time like today. Um, just to give you a broader background, what characterizes Berkeley and what characterizes Haas is a commitment to academic excellence at its very best in the context of a state institution. And that means that we have a mission to be value-driven and to make education accessible to everyone. Um, most of the students at Berkeley and Berkeley Haas are not white. Um, we have double the number of Pell Grant recipients of any other top university. Uh, um, these are really important commitments to us uh, in the context of very limited budgets. Our tuition is a third the tuition of any of our top private school competitors. And for those who can't afford that one third tuition, we provide uh, loans. Um, I should say that in light of these massive changes that we've just been confronted with, I have pivoted to some very important short term goals which are three. Number one, safety of students, staff, and faculty above all. Number two, providing the best instructional quality we can given the situation. And I'd be happy to talk about our investment in virtual classrooms, for example. And number three, preserving our sense of community and preserving as much as possible employment in the face of massive budget cuts. So, Michael, let me turn to you then. Um, Anne's kind of pivoted to the how this has changed some of their priorities or how they're being implemented now in this moment. What 
how did we get to this point and how are you thinking differently about your role now? When you say, how did we get to this point, do you mean? Uh, well, I guess I'm thinking in the you know, bigger picture, kind of the failings of our economy and democracy. It's a big question, but you know, growing inequality, um, decline of faith in institutions. Give us a, your perspective a bit on that, if you would, but sure, sure. also well, kind of how you're thinking about your role, if you are thinking about it any differently than before. Sure. So we, candidly, we got to this place because we failed an awful lot of people who needed us, right? The fact that we have such a large segment of our society that is unhappy, that is disenfranchised, we live in a world where over 50% of our students who attend public education from K through 12 um, are from low income and under-resourced communities. Um, that we have over 40, 45 million people living in poverty. So we are at this moment right now from a societal standpoint outside of the virus because our institutions have failed people when they gave them their faith. And we can make the argument that so many people, it served well and, and it has certainly served a segment of our society well. But I deal with the segment of society that has been failed, right? I mean, 85% of my students are Pell Grant students. You don't become a Pell Grant student if your family hasn't experienced long-term unemployment or long-term underemployment. Things haven't worked. And so then when you turn around and you see a country embrace um, leadership that is divisive, right? That marginalizes uh, a large segment of people who bought into the American experiment and the American dream. Um, and then you wonder why they don't trust. Well, they don't trust because they have been led not to trust. And we're in this moment exactly right now is sort of a product of a lack of trust because, you know, uh, we're in the midst of a global pandemic and we can't even get people to adopt the behaviors necessary to stem the tide in a permanent way. And, and there's lots of reasons for that. Now, the second part of your question, how I view my role, I view my role now is the same way that I've always viewed it. And that is to be something other than just the president of my institution, to be a voice for a segment of people who too often have been left voiceless, right? Um, I, you know, to me, I subscribe to the school of thought that our colleges and universities should turn themselves outward and address the needs of the day. And there was a time where we did that more aggressively. Now, everything that we deal with tends to be research projects. And let me be very clear, I respect research, I love research, that is important. But the answer to every person's question can't take five years to be discovered, right? At some point, we have to step up, speak up, and hurry up. And I represent that wing of higher education that believes we should be far more activist-oriented. So let me ask you one more and then turn the same question back to Anne, if I may. If you, if you kind of look back on this, try to, let's go time travel in the other direction, take us five years out. What, what may have happened in higher ed as a result of COVID? And what kinds of investments, if you are able to make them now, what kind of investments are you making now that you might not have made otherwise? So what things are actually changing as a result? And, and then we'll come back to you on this. Yeah, well, I think what you're going to see is people be open well, well, first of all, let me frame it this way. I think there's a segment of us that desperately want to go back to the way things were, right? That they think if we just really hope hard enough that, <laughs> well, right, right. I just go back to the office? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. You know, it's, although I, you know, I got to say, I like my home office a lot more these days, right? Um, I, I think what we're seeing is that there's this longing to go back to education the way that it was. And, you know, I, I'm not gonna comment on what I think about some of those decisions, but what I am gonna say is this, that I think going forward, you're going to see um, institutions that are far, far more nimble and far more willing to <clears throat> innovate quickly. I think that you're going to see students who 
are going to continue, and their families are going to continue to ask really important and relevant questions like, what exactly am I paying for? Is there another way for me to extract value from this experience? Is there a way for me to get more out of this experience? Right? I mean, I, I think it's interesting. So for so long, we told you, take a major, and that's what you were getting, right? Like, you're going to this. Now, I think you're looking at it, I mean, at least for us, we're saying, look, we're going to give you three types of education. We're going to give you your subject matter expertise. We're going to give you real world experiential learning because of the four years of internships that you're going to have. And starting now, we're going to give each student an opportunity to earn a credential or a certificate, an industry recognized credential and certificate, at least one each year. So ultimately, you could graduate from our institution subject matter expertise, four years of internships, and four to eight certificates, which allow you to access, you know, the job market in a very, very different way. Very helpful. It's good. Anne, what, do you, what, what kind of investments are you, you made a hint about this earlier. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And then I've got one more question of you both before we turn to Dan. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it was, you know, one of our th the themes, uh, my themes as a leader is somehow out of all this to try to emerge stronger. Um, and that is exactly what has been happening. In March, we were told that we had two days to go from in-person learning, the entire Haas community taught in person, to remote in 48 hours. Every single professor at Haas went from in-person to a virtual experience. We pivoted and yet we had been debating for 10 years whether or not it made sense to teach business remotely. Well, it turns out we could do it really fast if we had to. And so now what we're doing, having realized we can do this, we will do this, we have no choice but to do this, um, we are trying to do everything we can to make it better. Now, um, the University of California has made a decision that it will offer a hybrid instructional mode in the fall, which means that all courses will have a remote option, but some will be in person. But for the remote option, what we are doing is we are trying to, we are figuring out in real time, how do you go beyond basic Zoom? So we've, we've invested over a million dollars in what we call virtual classrooms, which in Zoom is not designed to focus on pedagogy. It's not designed to focus on the instructor in the classroom. We are creating classrooms where the instructor for all intents and purposes is surrounded by screens and, and actually can conduct a dialogue in real time with all the students when the students speak, the instructors sees their voice as coming from a screen. It's really cool stuff. It's 21st century stuff. So we're investing in all these things because we believe that even when we go back to face-to-face -to -face learning, which is so important for our university, there will still be an important component that will be remote. And that is changing higher education as we know it. So let me ask you, um, let me ask you both, and we all are having investment envy here. Um, we're hoping you're going to come and do this for the Aspen Institute and after you're done uh, implementing it at Haas. But let me think about the kind of balancing act that you are both um, have undertaken here. The, the, and I know, um, Michael, I've seen your posting, your, the op-ed you did about the need to not open up this fall, which I would be interested in knowing what kind of reaction that received. But I'm just kind of curious about the balancing act between managing to this incredible, you talked about 48 hour turnaround, people across the country experience something very similar to that, I assume. But how do you balance the management of the day to day, the constant pressures of decision making, real time consequential decisions to try to keep your eye on this long term need for institutional and for kind of almost cultural change. Do you have any habits, anything that you would suggest to this audience that's working for you to be able to keep the long-term in mind at the same time you're under such short-term pressure? Either one of you. I will defer to the Dean from the Business School at the University of California. And? 
kind of you, Michael. Um, <laughs> by the way, I just want to congratulate you on your Atlantic article which I read. It was beautifully written. It was so eloquent. I encourage all of our listeners to read his, the article in the Atlantic that came out. Um, so, you know, I was a professor actually at various places, including Wharton, before I took this job. And as a professor, you're constantly balancing the short term, which is in the classroom teaching, doing a great job, and the long term, which is creating cutting edge research that can sometimes take years to come to fruition. And so you constantly have to balance these things. And so being a dean is really no different. We need to worry about the safety of our students, instructional quality, we need to worry about inclusion. In, but we also need to think about what will Haas look like five years from now. So for example, one of the things I've been spending a lot of time on is creating an entrepreneurship hub, taking a Julia Morgan building and turning it into a center for all students on campus who want to create startups. How do you do that? You have to compartmentalize your time. So for example, I choose either you can choose half a day or a day a week where you think about the big issues. And if you don't carve out time, for the big issues, you just get completely consumed by the day-to-day. -day. And so the equivalent of that as a professor is you end up with great teaching, which is hugely important and we really value that. But if you put all your time into teaching, you get no research done. Um, and, and so you constantly have to be doing both. And it's tough, but um, one can certainly do multiple things. As a woman, of course, I've been having to multitask, take care of my kids, who you might see behind me, manage the household, go to work, take care of my aging parents forever, right? So being a dean is actually pretty easy <laughs> running I'm my glad household. i to hear that. <laughs> Michael, how about you? Any words of wisdom on the balancing act? Any habits you want to share? Yeah, I, I would first of all say that it turns out it's so much easier to be a college president and to run a homeschool enterprise for my two children, um, that is a whole different world. Like, they don't even sit down when you tell them to sit down, right? <laughs> um, here, here's the thing. All of this is going to require a juggling act, right? But it, it's what we signed up for. Um, for me, I try and break my day down into parts. And I like to get up and exercise in the morning in part because, you know, I'm a bit of an exercise fanatic, but it gives me an opportunity to think, right? Just to ideate, you know, when I'm out on my bicycle or when I'm walking, you know, it gives me a chance to play things over and over. And I have discovered that I am at my most innovative and creative between the hours of 4.30 and seven, right? So when I have things to write, that is when I try to write. Um, the rest of my day, I lose to meetings, now to Zoom calls, um, and, and that makes it tough. But at the end of the day, um, the, the gift of all of this is that we are in places where we have things we can contribute and we work on behalf of people that we love. And I can't imagine, you know, I was a corporate securities lawyer prior to my career as an entrepreneur and in higher education. And I will just tell you, this, this is so much more fulfilling to me than that was. So I'm just thankful to have the opportunity to do it. Thank you both. So Dan, let me turn to you if I might. What are you hearing in this conversation? Um, I think I'm hearing uh, a, a, just a great deal of inspiring thoughts from two organizational leaders that have their priorities right and that value being servant leaders for their communities um, and that understand the power of institutions in our society to structure a good and important and enduring work. So tell us a little bit more, if you would. I'd like to hear more from you. I know the institution well, of course, having been there for, for a long time. But 
I'd love to have you reflect a little bit on, first of all, on your own kind of leadership journey here, having been in higher education for many years, the work you did at FNM, but just share a little bit about that story and your transition to the Aspen Institute. And then let's come back and talk a little bit about the Institute and what you see for it in this moment. Um, okay, thank you. So um, I guess what I like doing is trying to help people. And that was when I was, when I was younger, I was a basketball coach and I was a tutor and a mentor and I worked with immigrant children for a while, with court supervised youth for a while. I taught in prisons. I taught in Georgetown University, lived on campus with my family. I just like helping people. That's really what I, I, I like to do. And that's what gives me pleasure. And there are different ways to do that, you know? And, and um, one way is, in, is working to help an organization do its best work, which means empowering the people in the organization or supporting them to do their best work. But that's what I like, and I think it's a good way to, for me to live is to be open to any number of different roles or ways of expressing myself, you know, but the main thing is to try to be somebody that helps other people. So m moving from higher ed to, um, to a nonprofit, you know, sort of a global nonprofit organization like the Asp Institute was a very natural move because it felt like this was another way where I could make a contribution, try to make a difference. Can you um, talk a little bit about the work you did at FNM that is germane to this conversation of addressing inequalities and access to education? Well, there's a couple of FNM colleagues on this call, so I want to say hi to uh, Kosti Karelis, uh, Nancy Kurland, and Jeff Nesterek. So, uh, three, three members of the faculty, two in our business organization society program, and one in our classics department. They are awesome teachers, professors, mentors, scholars, um, role models. And what I was doing was working with them and partnering with them to help uh, Franklin and Marshall College develop itself for this chapter in its history, which means engaging the questions of the world and the needs of students and communities. One thing that we all did together was that we really focused on expanding access to Franklin and Marshall College by building a needs blind, uh, full needs, uh, financial aid policy. Um, I should say, I should say a full need financial aid policy. Um, we were need aware, not needs blind. And the faculty really worked <clears throat> together with people working in admission and me to develop a, a learning culture that was responsive to a changing demographic. That was, that was a lot of fun to see that come together and see these great kids come to the school and really do well. Now, Michael runs an institution, and I, Michael and I are friends, and I've admired his work for a long time. So he runs an institution that's making just as big an impact in its way as mine did and as Berkeley Haas did. You know, we're all trying to make a difference. And in our case, we tripled our Pell Grant population over a short period of time, six, seven years. But it, it wasn't, we didn't get to 85%, <laughs> that's for sure, Michael. We were in the ballpark of 20% at the end of the time when I was there. It was exciting to see the students from more backgrounds, engage college opportunity, and, and really l learn together with others and love uh, yeah. liberal arts education. And something that's very important, I like to always emphasize, is if you look at some of those metrics, like, um, like grades, GPAs, and uh, achieving honors at graduation, and job placement, at the individual level, the Pell Grant students at Franklin and Marshall College achieved at or above, depending on the category, the student body as a whole. And if you look at the institution's overall profile, the applications went from like 5,000 to like 9,000 during this time of opening our doors that much more widely to students from more communities all around the country. Um, so that's, you know, I think that expanding educational opportunity, in my judgment, is the right thing to do and the smart thing to do, right? Because it responds to the, the ethical requirement in a democracy that we ex extend equity in all we do. Smart thing to do because by expanding educational opportunity to more students who have the drive and the guts to go for it, you increase the educational value for all students and you even put the institution potentially on a stronger footing because it has a much bigger applicant base and a much wider name recognition. What's, um, 
kind of curious if you could say what the biggest barrier to that change was at FNM. And actually, I might throw this back to Ann and Michael um, later on. But Dan, what is there? It couldn't have all been a cakewalk. No, and it's not done. And the institution's a living entity. And, you know, Nancy and Jeff and Costis are responsible for so much of it. So I almost don't, wouldn't want to speak for them. But I would simply say that I guess the barrier is money that it's hard to afford for almost any institution, it's hard to afford um, keeping cost of higher ed reasonable right now. And in Franklin and Marshall College, the faculty, the board, the administration, all really committed to a tripling of the, the financial aid budget. And that's essential. And it means that, that there's not unlimited money by any means for all kinds of other things. Also, I can't help but say this, the U.S. News and World Rankings penalize you for increasing your need-based financial aid budget. Not that, they, not that they don't care, they penalize you. And the reason for that is that the, um, they measure the amount of dollars spent on educational excellence as a part of their framework for creating the hierarchy that they've created. Their assumption is the more you spend the better the education, which is itself preposterous. But secondly, the money you spend on financial aid doesn't count in that algorithm. You could spend all the money on blackboards and new buildings, it would count. You spend it on financial aid, it Very doesn't. Which is like, it's like paying money to go to a play and not caring who's in the cast. The school is the students. So there's other ways to, I could go into that more if you wanted to, but so the barrier would be, right. we have structural, I'm going to be very blunt. We have structural impediments that structural racism and structural impediments around poverty that mean that schools that are trying to increase their need-based financial aid have to work within a system where they're penalized for doing exactly what education and democracy is supposed to do. So we could follow this one a long ways and maybe we'll be able to come back to the question of whether COVID is actually going to great, make it more difficult and potentially if these institutions will lead into becoming more elite institutions. But let's see if we can get back to that. First, I want to get you to speak a little bit more about the Aspen Institute. This panel is titled Democracy and Capitalism, and that goes right to the heart of the Institute. I know the history as you do. Can you talk a little bit about this relationship and how the Institute got founded and what your priorities are now? Yeah, the Aspen Institute is a global nonprofit that um, drives change towards a free, just, and equitable society. We have a lot of tools in our toolbox, more than 70 programs. 30 of them work on policy issues and social issues and try to solve problems in a nonpartisan way, like Judy's remarkable program, the Business and Society program. And we have programs focused on public health, public education, uh, higher education, national security, um, the needs of uh, out of work, out of school, young people, uh, and more. 15 of our programs are leadership programs that focus on finding people between ages of 35 and 45 who have already achieved a great deal in their work to create a better society and giving them the cohort experience of climbing the next mountain together to make a social difference. Seven of those fellows were candidates for president this year, and two of them are strong contenders for vice president right now. Um, and then we have 11 global Aspens around the world, Aspen India, Aspen Mexico, Aspen Spain, Aspen Ukraine, Aspen Central Europe, that are all about the idea of an open society, the free exchange of ideas, uh, and broadly speaking, the involvement of the private sector and the public sector and the civil society together to help people. That's a quick look at us. So we have a lot of tools in the toolbox. And um, we've established as a few priorities that we want to focus on inclusive uh, economic development. We want to fo focus on uh, inviting, engaging, empowering, inspiring the young to step into leadership opportunities in society. We want to focus on recognizing and celebrating and holding up leadership in all communities in all forms, not just sort of like people that lead institutions, um, and making sure that those that do lead institutions, as Judy does, are thinking ethically and not just in terms of sort of power and transactional dynamics of leadership. Um, and we want to focus in time on working together with many others to strengthen the pillars 
of a working democracy. And that includes many institutions. The last thing to say is that since the COVID-19 crisis, we too have had to adjust what we are called to do because we must call to hear the call to respond to crying inequities that we've known about but not addressed for too long, especially in terms of racial inequities. And so even as I say we have some priorities, we're still leaning into how also will we put on the front burner the work of addressing racial uh, injustice in its many forms. Let me put our spotlight back on this question of integration of, of the humanities into the teaching. Um, that the Institute itself was kind of founded with the idea of teaching the kind of great books as a way of kind of illuminating the tensions between democracy and capitalism. Can you talk a bit about the, either the challenge or the role of the humanities in this moment? It feels like we could very well be facing a moment where there's a real expectation of, of kind of, you know, work, learn models that might make it more difficult to introduce the kinds of benefits of, of a liberalized education. Yeah. Can you talk about that, yeah. Dan? And then I'd like to open that up to, to uh, Michael and Ann as well. I, I feel a moment of pontification taking over me. So I'm, I'm going to try to uh, follow uh, the examples of, of uh, Ann and Michael and not do that. But I, I believe, of course, that humanistic inquiry uh, and humanistic and aesthetic knowledge is central to the human being, to cultures, to community, to family, to life itself. Absolutely essential. It also, humanistic inquiry equips people for citizenship for all sorts of reasons. It has intrinsic benefits, but it also has instrumental benefits in terms of how a person learns. I believe the humanities, not alone, but with social sciences and with the sciences integrated the way FNM does it, um, I think that that model helps young people develop, of course, knowledge, of course, skills necessary for a global knowledge economy where so much is being uh, routinized uh, so, that, so that people that, uh, that need to be able to think uh, in order to really be able to contribute and have a power over a long period of time as jobs change so quickly with automation. But the humanities, again, with the sciences, with uh, math, some people think math could be a humanity, um, with social science and business study, also create mindsets that students take with them into their adult years that maybe last even longer than the knowledge they gain. For example, the mindset to be an active learner, relentless. That's something that's critical for our society. Or for example, the mindset to create, to innovate, to make, to stamp your tattoo on the world, or the mindset to work in teams, to think that problem posing as well as problem solving requires collective endeavor and that working in teams is a mindset that is about being open to the contributions many can make, or the mindset to strive, to want, as I said before, to climb the next mountain. I see those mindsets along with skills and knowledge as being fostered in an environment that integrates humanistic, social science, and scientific thought. Michael, let me, um, and thank you. That was inspired. Michael, let me turn to you. You call Paul Quinn a humanities-inspired institution. How does that land? Well, we're a liberal arts-inspired institution, right? It's um, one of the things that we are very, very clear on is as long as you allow yourself to be defined by someone else's narrative, it's very difficult for you to ever truly succeed, All right? So we started out with this goal that we are going to be one of America's great small colleges. And that was intentional, right? Because saying small college freed us from sort of the definitional shackles of liberal arts. Right, and let me be very clear. I, like I am, my undergrad institution was Oberlin, so I am steeped in the liberal arts institutions. Okay, but we needed more freedom to be more responsive. You know, we didn't want people, say, faculty members, saying to us, "Well, we're not going to focus on this because that's not what we traditionally do." 
we wanted people thinking about it from a more of an entrepreneurial thought and action mindset. And so for us, it was, of course, we support lifelong learning. Um, we think there is truthfully nothing better than lifelong learning. But we have to acknowledge the economic realities of our students. So maybe we should talk about lifelong earning and providing pathways on and off or in and out of academia to allow one to continue to make progress. I mean, we are, we've got this amazing new take on adult education, which starts uh, in August, actually. And it's called PQCX. And the idea is it's short-term, inexpensive credentialing programs. And it's acknowledging that one has time to come back and work full-time, raise a family, and get their degrees. Like, that is a miserable life. I know it because that's how I got my doctorate, right? Because I wanted to find out what's it like. I mean, I, I was very fortunate. My parents did well. I got three degrees in 10 years. I worked because that's what you needed to do to build your resume. But here I am leading an institution where the students don't share the same demographic makeup that I did. But I'm supposed to make decisions in their best interest when I don't really know it. So I immerse myself in life as a full-time working student. It is horrible, right? Like you are stressed out all the time. You feel, I mean, I didn't feel like I was doing right by my family. I didn't feel like I was doing great in my job. I mean, I was writing papers all the time. I mean, it was just, no one should have to live that way. And so when you acknowledge that, you say, look, let's build in something that really says to people, we understand what you're going through. Um, and so we tried to do that. And, and I just, for one moment, I, I wanna refer back to something that, you know, we were talking about here. Higher education has to take some responsibility for where our society is right now. Every single person involved in screwing this thing up is a college graduate, right? Because that's who makes it into these leadership positions. Something we are doing is not communicating, it's not communicating the way we should communicate. What is it about being an engaged citizen? Like, how do we do those things? Um, so. I just think that as we look at this and as we're going forward, we're gonna to have to take some ownership and create learning mechanisms which allow us to embrace democracy in a very real and fulfilling way. And before, I'd be happy to have you respond as well, but I wanna put a question out that appeared in the, in the chat. Um, this person is essentially saying that they think the B-School curriculum is responsible for some of the flaws in our society. That it's not accurate to say that all people are self-interested, especially regardless of their position and responsibility, or that the markets magically will produce social goods. And he seems to be challenging, essentially saying he's kind of ashamed of all of this. You know, how do we, what is it that actually has to change in the curriculum? And I, I'll turn to you, Anne, not to cold call you on the toughest question, but you know, you've talked about environmental sustainability as an important you know, pillar of, of Haas's future. You know, are we teaching one thing in the, in the, in the finance classroom about you know, discounting the future and you can't put a price on uh, clean air and something else in, in the environment course room? Like what do you see in terms of some of the change that may need to be taking place? There's an entire new wing of economics that is essentially saying it's not about growth. What are you seeing from where you sit in the challenge of changing up the curriculum? Yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to talk about that. Although I do want to say one thing about what got us here. Um, I do a lot of work uh, on China. I spent a lot of time in China and India. I worked at the World Bank as a director before I became an academic. Um, and I think our problem actually, I mean, we have many problems in the United States. I was actually, I'm actually an immigrant. I was born in France. Um, I think the problem is actually that not, that we're not doing enough education. Um, the percentage of people getting a college degree in China has now exceeded the percentage in the United States. Only one in three people in the US actually get a college degree. 
Uh, right now, that number in China is about 40%. Um, it's not that we're doing too much educating, it's that we're not doing enough. And that's what I think has gotten us to this point. So that's just, that's a different, that's a different kind of com conversation. But let me talk about economics and what got us in this mess. So it's interesting, I actually, my, as an economist, I work on what's known as industrial policy, which is how, how and what should the state do to try to fix problems that we see in society. And, and I don't think it's surprising that of all the people Hoskins chose, they chose me to lead the institution. Um, economics theory clearly states that the market doesn't work well by itself. Um, capitalism can work, but um, there are often what's called market failures. There have been market failures in, in, um, in the area of the environment. There are failures in our ability to educate our people. There are failures in our ability to provide health care for our U.S. population. And um, the, the economics states very clearly that there is a rationale for not leaving things to the market. And I have spent my research career explaining how do you intervene well? Why is it that a country like New Zealand, which is quote unquote capitalist, has no cases of COVID-19, has never forced its people to, to uh, stop engaging in economics? Why is it that actually most of the world, including most of Asia, China, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, they're capitalists essentially. And, you know, they have fixed the problem because they believe in a government that intervenes and that intervenes from the top with leadership. And so I see no conflict between essential economic theory, which I have taught for years, and what we need to be doing as a country, which we're not doing. Um, uh, you know, and Haas teaches, uh, Haas teaches economics, but it teaches economics in a way that allows for going, quote unquote, beyond yourself. Um, and our basic economics allows for that. I've written a lot about it, if you want to look at my writings. And I, I don't see, um, and I've particularly in the area of the environment, uh, I call this green industrial policy. The environment is the strongest case for the market not fixing things alone. And they teach that in business school. They teach that at Berkeley, at Haas, but they teach it in other places as well. Michael, what's your reaction? To which part? This question is what has to change in business education? Well, I, I love the Dean's answer, right? I mean, I, I think that we, there is no question that people aren't learning enough, right? I mean, we're in this era where people want to believe that their ignorance is the equivalent to someone else's intelligence. That is a farce, okay? Um, I think we do have to acknowledge that there are aspects of capitalism that experience failures from time to time. We, we see that now and that they do require a market correction. Um, but we romanticize that, right? Like, I mean, part of this is, excuse me, we're so entrenched in our political system, but we don't even know what those political systems beliefs actually are. So, you know, like, it's interesting to me, you, you know, typically you think, well, Republicans, you don't believe in big government. And I mean, like we can point to the expansion of government right now and say, well, maybe that's not quite true. But we, we don't take the time to fully understand the labels, right? We just, we look at it and we say, well, people who look like me, who seem to be like me, who come from where I come from, they believe this, so I'm going to believe this. And we, we don't engage in any critical thought. And I think we see that same thing applied to, you know, to business. I mean, listen, we have to address the economic disparity and the gaps in wealth. I mean, we have to, you cannot sustain a democracy 
with this level of, of disparity. Because what happens is when people are angry, when they're suffering, when they are struggling, they lose faith in the system. If they lose faith in the system, they stop supporting the system. They stop supporting the system. They rebel against the system. And we know where that ends up. So there is actually an incentive for people to exercise some level of compassion and not to maximize their ability to, to make money at the expense of other people. But we seem to have lost that, right? We keep thinking, if I have more, 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 will insulate me from whatever evils are out there. And at some point, you have to acknowledge you can't outrun your greed. You can't. Dan, you want to jump in there? Well, I've only been at two institutions, Georgetown University, which has a fine business school, and Franklin and Marshall, which has an extraordinary business major, the business organization society. They're different, but I liked at Georgetown the way that ethical considerations were often woven into the curriculum as a part of the institution's calling as a Jesuit, uh, as a Jesuit university. And Franklin and Marshall, I think that the Voss program is taught as a liberal art, it's business as a liberal art, um, with all of the rigor, uh, critical thinking, independence of ideas celebrated that you, you might associate with, with, with other disciplines, beautifully, beautifully taught, beautifully conceived. So I've seen two really good models. Um, and uh, I know there's, there's plenty of business programs out there probably that aren't expanding access to underrepresented students, that aren't raising ethical considerations, that are teaching more uh, transactional values than um, community civic values. But I haven't seen those. <laughs> I've just seen the two places I've been. And those are good examples to call out for others, I think. So I want to maybe think, pause at this. We'll come back to this question before we close up. But you know, kind of what is actually teachable about this moment? I just want to let that one sit for a minute and turn turn our turn to our kind of crystal balls about about the end game here for higher education. There's a um, lots of people have been commenting on what's likely to be some severe disruption to kind of the institution of higher education. And one of the ones we've been watching is Scott uh, Scott Galloway's work. He's a marketing professor at NYU. Many of you have already read what he's been writing about. But he writes and talks about big tech. Class MBA, by the way. Well, there you go. Now, see, that explains it all, doesn't it? Um, he's been talking about big tech's potential incursion into higher education post-COVID. Is uh, talking about replacing as many as 500 to 1,000 liberal arts colleges this is the result of technology needing to continue. You know, it's a, it's a voracious uh, growth machine and that higher education is maybe ripe for acquisition. So talking about whether or not it will start to play a principal role, not a subsidiary role, but a principal role in managing and delivering on education in partnership, but you know, probably directly as well. Do any of you have a point of view on that, a perspective? This sounds to me fairly frightening, but there may be great things about it. Potential to reach many more people, perhaps. Michael, I see you leaning in. Uh, I just want to say this. I think we have a tendency to grab on to things and just ride them out to their Orwellian conclusion, right? I mean, I, I don't... Do I think big tech will get engaged? Probably. Do I think that they will drive institutions out of business in a way that um, becomes terrifying? I don't. I don't think that. Um, listen, we let's just bring this to historically black colleges, right? The demise of historically black colleges has been predicted since their inception. All right. And at each stage, I mean, and let's just play this out historically. When they started, they were educating people who had no foundation for education, had no money to pay for an education. So the thought was these institutions cannot last because there's no foundation to support them, right? They're, they're not going to be capable of sustaining themselves. Then we got to um, 
you know, the segregation. And the thought was, oh, they're going to go away because now black students can go to PWIs. Well, that didn't happen either. And so at each stage, we have a tendency to think that every new thing destroys that which comes before it. When really what every new thing does is issue a challenge to evolve, to innovate, to move forward. And so, yes, I do think there'll be some tech companies that engage and find their way into the marketplace as well they should. And I think they will inspire institutions to look for new ways to compete. I mean, I, I don't understand what it is that we think we shouldn't have to compete. We should absolutely have to compete. Competition is fantastic, right? So I, I, just, I just caution us to be terrified of people coming into our sandbox. Maybe it's an invitation for us to be better in our own sandbox. Yeah. I, I just want to echo that, actually take it back to the conversation about government intervention and industrial policy. One of the things I found studying China and why and how China was so effective in engaging in massive government intervention and yet growing uh, double digit for decades is because it promoted competition along with government support. So at every step of the way, competition was a critical element to minimize the dangers of the wrong kind of government intervention. So I really am a big believer in competition. I also believe that if we play, if we do the right thing, that we will emerge stronger as a set of academic institutions because of this. We will cast our net more widely. We will be able to offer education to people all over the world, um, remotely or not. And we will also extend it to a much wider group of individuals. One of the things I did for a small percentage of students this spring is I eliminated the testing requirement for the MBA program. So for some UC Berkeley, or UC Berkeley grads, you can apply to our MBA program this fall, one time only, and not take the GMAT or the GRE. The response was unbelievable. The test requirement is such a barrier to applications. I had no idea. UC Berkeley and the UC system is actually going to get rid of, for the undergraduates, eventually is phasing out the SAT and ACT requirement, which is, is that a permanent decision. It looks like it, yes. It's clearly a barrier to applications. There's a lot of barriers out there. So I see our future, and of course I see Haas' future and Berkeley's future, more access, more inclusion, different ways of offering phenomenal instruction. Wasn't it meant to be a barrier though? I mean, you know, I'm part of a group that's working with ETS to create some alternatives to standardized testing and a ways of evaluating um, how students, how likely students are to succeed. And one of the things that, you know, if we're honest, those tests were always meant to be barriers, right? It wasn't until we got to this stage where we realized maybe those aren't the right barriers, right? I mean, like maybe we've gone awry. And so, you know, it succeeded. It did exactly what it was supposed to do. Now we're in an era where we needed to do something else. We need more people to be educated. They're, they're also, besides being er erecting barriers, they also are branding opportunities for the institutions because it gives the institution a seemingly algebraically perfect way of describing its academic, the quality of its student body by its median you know, SAT or ACT scores. Which is just well, be, I mean, let me be honest, Berkeley gets a hundred thousand applications a year. We take we've increased our student body by thirty to forty percent over the last twenty years. In the last forty years, since I was an undergraduate at Berkeley, get this, in the last forty years, we have not added one 
professor, not one, okay? The school has kept the same number of teachers, added 40% more students, and not surprisingly has a terrible overcrowding problem. Why haven't we added more professors? Because the state has just reduced and reduced and reduced its support. It's now supporting 10% of our revenues. The other 90%, it's up to us. Um, we want to take more students. We're taking more students, but we need more resources to increase the number of faculty. That's my only wine today. Oh, I um, think that's a good point. And as you've seen, yeah. you've seen, unfortunately, the savage cutting of higher education budgets in every state in the country. Only like seven have even gotten back to the 2008 levels before yeah. the recession. It's terrible. The cost shifting has gone right to working families. Um, and, it's, and it isn't going to stop unless people vote for education, vote for educational equity. That's going to that's gonna take some doing, but hopefully that's what will happen. So we have time for me to do one wrap-up question and then, uh, and then a couple of announcements as we close down here. And I'm torn between two questions. I'm going to put them both out there. Um, if you keep your answer down to a minute, we'll be able to get through them. One, I'm just kind of curious as we close, if you can say something about the mental health uh, of your students, what you're concerned about there. And then finally, if we convene in a year, and we hope we'll be convening in person next year, hosted by Bucknell and Franklin and Marshall and Wharton in Pennsylvania, what kind of conversation will we be having then? So a little Here. bit about the state of play for your students in this moment and what you're thinking about to support them. And then what kind of conversation will we be having a year from now? Uh, I think our students are going to suffer tremendous mental health um, challenges as a result of what's going on. Uh, I mean, if we're honest, our students were already experiencing significant mental health challenges. And those are exacerbated by a global pandemic, which we have no end. We have no ability to predict the end. <clears throat> they are entering into an economic environment that is at best difficult. Um, everything that they knew and believed has shifted. So, I mean, we have moved to a 24 hour telehealth system. Um, we call it Quinn Care. And so our students at any time can reach out and get not just the medical help they need, but the emotional and mental support that they need as well as a way of ensuring that they get the support and the help that they need. Um, and you know, to answer your question about what do we think things look like in a year, I think it depends on how many stops and starts we've had in that year, right? How many times have, like, have we made decisions which allow us to safely re-enter um, life the way that we have become accustomed to it? Or have we made decisions that cause us to stop and start, stop and start? Um, and then also, I think it's where we are on the pathway to coming up with a vaccine and how much safer we feel. This is going to have a chilling effect on us for a very long time. Dan? Um, I guess I would say that um, we, we don't know where we're going to be. As, you know, we really don't know what's going to be the impact of this. I think that the, um, the epidemic of racial violence and structural racism and the, and the response of anger and frustration uh, is very important, just as important, more important than COVID. And that I'm hoping that that second trend catalyzes a continued awakening of the country for the incredible importance of investing in education equitably at all levels of education you know, starting very young. I'm hoping that's the takeaway from this, that the combination of COVID plus a recession plus a reckoning about racial injustice leads us to say, enough, restructure education so that all have equitable opportunity. A second thing, and I won't go on long, is that some institutions will stand out for the leaders and the faculty and the way they come together. And those institutions will be the case studies that all of us in this group are thinking about in the future. And Paul Quinn College is one of those case studies right now. And I would encourage people 
maybe just meeting Michael for the first time, to look up what he and the faculty together have done at Paul Quinn College as they coped with extraordinary financial challenge and were able, as Ann said, to come out of it or move through it stronger because they relied upon their core values and each other in protecting a great historically black institution. So those are my two things. Those are my two sort of what's gonna come next. Um, massive new commitment to education and leaders will emerge who, who steer institutions in a way that others will then imitate. And what would you add? I'm gonna make a couple of announcements and then come back and see what you would add in terms of a teachable moment. But anything you would add about the, your experience with kind of the mental health of students and what's needed and what we might be talking about a year from now? Um, well, COVID has accelerated an already steady trend towards increasing um, mental strain among students in America. It was already growing. We've seen it along on college campuses everywhere. Um, and this has obviously and very clearly accelerated it. Um, students are under tremendous pressure and whatever we can do to uh, alleviate that, uh, we can do. Uh, I, I've won most of my battles in my first year and a half. But one battle I lost was to try to eliminate um, a forced curve in, among our undergraduates, which I think is a terrible thing and mm -hmm. I think it's accelerating stress and I will come back to that, uh, whatever we can do. Uh, the future does look well, really bad. Um, um, if we find a vaccine, that will help. If we don't find vaccine, we have to figure out how to test, trace, and isolate. Who ends up winning the presidential election will be absolutely critical. We haven't talked about that at all, but let me tell you, we should all be out there campaigning um, and not for the current sitting president either, um, just in case I needed to make myself crystal clear. Um, I think that will make a huge difference who we pick. Uh, regardless of who we pick, if we do get a vaccine, the economic recovery will be slow. Um, I think the issues that I have focused on and will continue to focus on of inclusion and sustainability will continue to be key. Um, yeah. California, we were closed down by wildfires way before we yeah. were closed down by the pandemic. We could talk about that for a long time and we will be doing. Let me just like say a couple of things and then Michael, I'm gonna come back to you for the closing thought on a teachable moment here. Um, but I just, I wanna, remind you that tomorrow we'll be doing a webinar at 1 p.m. Eastern time and it's about teaching to this COVID moment and we'll be um, being able to kind of take a bird's eye view into two courses that have been rapidly developed at Oberlin and at the Wharton School by two fabulous faculty moments, faculty members um, and there's much more to learn about the Aspen Institute. Feel free to send information into the chat box if, or into the Q&A if you'd like to be contacted about anything in particular. We welcome all of you to could stay at the table with us here. We will be sending a link to the recording and a kind of a synopsis of the Q&A out to you all. And with that, I would look forward to seeing you all again, we hope in person next year. Um, and I also, of course, would like to thank the Teagle Foundation, which helps support the transition of this meeting to a virtual platform from the in-person in meeting that we were planning originally, and also to Johnson & Johnson, which has been supportive of our work in business education more generally. So I'm scanning to make sure I didn't forget any important announcements, but with that, let me turn it back to you, Michael. Teachable moment? Um, you know, I, I think the, the most teachable moment is recognizing the impact <clears throat> that our civic engagement has on the rest of our life, right? I mean, the series of things that have occurred that have led us to this moment um, are, are in part because of a lack of awareness and engagement civically. And so I, I think that, you know, all the things that we haven't really paid the kind of attention to that we should um, it's time for us to understand their impact in our daily lives. Anne, anything you'd add? 
Um, I think the teachable moment is Brian Stevenson's that um, we, when we have, when we see the proximity that we have to one another and understand our interdependence, we grow as human beings. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks to my colleagues that helped pull this together. And thank you all very much for joining us, both the members of the Undergraduate Consortium and well beyond. We look forward to seeing menu again tomorrow. And thank you to my panelists, to Michael, to Anne, and to Dan. You've enriched our conversation and we're grateful to have had you with us today.